Welcome to TNT Sports Talk. Today is Thursday, February 14th. As always, we are presented by D's Home Cuts. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Uh, probably the worst holiday ever created. It was just made up by a greeting card company. But we do have to celebrate it for some reason. But I'm your host, Travis Karczewski. Just me today. We're going to... Going to talk for about 15 minutes, and then we have a fantastic interview with Brian Anderson, professional sports broadcaster. Probably one of the best interviews, if not the best interview we ever had. Definitely the most interesting person we've ever had on to interview. Uh, we got to spend a half hour with him talking sports and his career, and it was just really interesting and probably one of the best ways to spend a half hour that you can think of. So tune in later for that great interview. We'll talk a little bit more about him and his career when we get to the interview. But we're going to start with basketball. Um, I want to talk a couple things about that. First off, Isaiah Thomas made his debut last night for the Denver Nuggets. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I am a huge Isaiah Thomas fan. I think Isaiah Thomas is one of the most underrated players in the NBA, and I think he gets a lot of unnecessary hate from fans and Twitter and from the NBA in general. Uh, you know, last season wasn't the best. He didn't follow up his MVP caliber season with the Celtics in the best way. You know, he was dealing with a hip injury. He missed about half the season. And then he was traded to the the Lakers. Um, I believe that was the Clarkson and Nance trade. Um, and he kind of came off the bench the rest of the year. This is a new opportunity for him, though. I feel like this is fully a fresh start. The Nuggets gave him an opportunity to sit they didn't want him to play right away they gave him an opportunity to sit and fully get healthy and you know he's taken half the year off up to this point and hopefully he's fully healthy now but he came in last night to a standing ovation from the Nuggets crowd they love him there and he went out there put up 13 minutes and put up eight points which is a pretty good effort for your first game in a long time and only eight minutes only 13 minutes actually was a really good effort from him uh, so that was really cool to see. I just think, you know, after the Celtics game, after the Celtics run, I guess you could say, I just don't understand why they they traded him. And then he started to get a lot of hate just because he was hurt and he, was, he wasn't playing that well in Cleveland. And I think when he was with the Celtics, he was that leader there. He was the leader in the locker room. He was their guy. And when he was traded to the Cavs, you know, all he knew last, all he knew the year before that with the Celtics was how to be a leader, how to be the number one guy in the locker room. And then when he was traded to the Cavs, it was no longer like that. It was LeBron um, taking kind of the, you know, the leadership role in the Cavs locker room. It wasn't Isaiah Thomas, and I think people resented it. I think fans and I think his teammates a little bit resented him for trying to take on that leadership role, even though he did. He just that's all he knew when he came from the Celtics. But I think he deserves a lot of unnecessary hate. I think he gets a lot of unnecessary hate. And I'm really happy to see him bounce back with the Nuggets. He's had a fantastic career. He's always been that underdog. You know, he's picked with the last pick in the NBA um, draft a couple of years ago. And he's just always been that kind of underdog, you know, secret that nobody ever really talks about. But this is a good opportunity for him to bounce back and help lead the Nuggets to a pretty good spot in the playoffs and maybe even a run at the championship. But we're going to do like we do every Thursday. We didn't do it last Thursday because we had a um, a lot of headlines to get through. But we're going to do what we always do, and that is go through the standings real quick. Give a quick rundown through the standings. We'll start where we always start. In the East, uh, Truman's Milwaukee Bucks are leading the East. I'm not going to talk about the Bucks. I don't talk about the Bucks because I hate the Bucks, and I don't think they're as good as people think. Uh, Toronto's number two. Indiana staying strong at number three without Oladipo is impressive. Boston at number four, but they are falling, and they are falling quickly. Uh, Philadelphia at number five. Brooklyn six. Charlotte seven. And, Miami, and Detroit at number eight with Miami right on the outside looking in, tied with Detroit. Go to the West. We'll go with Oklahoma, not Oklahoma City. Golden State is number one. Denver's two. Oklahoma City's three. Portland four. Houston five. Utah six. San Antonio seven. And the LA Clippers uh, eight. And then you got Sacramento on the outside looking at. And then you got the Lakers at the tenth seed right now on the outside looking in as well. The Lakers, they're going through a bit of a rough stretch right now, and you love to see that. If you're a LeBron hater like me, you love to see the Lakers struggling because you love to see LeBron fail. 
I just hate seeing that guy succeed over and over and over again. And it's just nice to see, you know, his little strategy of tampering and trying to get Anthony Davis is sort of backfiring on him. So that's what I love to watch and love to see. But we got to keep watch on that. But we're going to move on now to football. Again, we're going through these quickly, these headlines pretty quickly due to the interview with Brian Anderson, which uh, was our longest interview ever. Uh, but we're going to move now to football. But before that, I had to remind you guys are about our guy, Andrew, at A's Lawn Service. Since 2014, A's Lawn Service has been providing professional landscaping at a low and fair price. Turn to A's Lawn Service for all your landscaping needs. And trust me, your lawn and your home will never look better. A's Lawn Service, uh, give them a call. The number is 330-241-2392. And the email is lawnservice.a's at gmail.com. A's Lawn Service, LLC. You grow it, they'll cut it. Joe Flacco. Is he elite? Well, he's going to get another chance to prove his eliteness in Denver this season as he was traded yesterday for a mid-round pick. I'm not really sure what the Broncos were thinking on this. They traded, they quite possibly have the whitest quarterback room in the nation right now, in the league right now, uh, with Joe Flacco and Case Keenum. I'm not do they have, if they have Trevor Simeon, that easily solidifies them as the whitest QB room in the in the league right now. Uh, I'm gonna check it out real quick. But he was traded yesterday. They're trying to trade Case Keenum right now, and you'll love uh, one of the sources as to why they traded him, what they said, why they traded for him. Um, after I check this real quick. Um, Oh, they have Kevin Hogan. Kevin Hogan is one of the whitest quarterbacks in the NFL, too. Um, so easily they have the whitest quarterback room in the league right now. And then Joe Flacco coming in just makes that even better. Um, so, yeah, they're trying to trade Case Keenum right now. I'm not really sure if I got fooled on this tweet or this was just something that's fake or something like that. But they said that the Broncos traded for Kate, traded for Joe Flacco. Because Joe Flacco makes you want to fight for every inch that you get on the football field. And Case Keenum doesn't do that. Now when I hear that, I hear that Joe Flacco is some sort of rah-rah motivator type of person. But I have never seen that from him in my entire uh, career of watching NFL football. I've never seen Joe Flacco get into the huddle and fire guys up. He's a good quarterback. He's a decent quarterback. And uh, I just think the Broncos' offense is not going to look any bit different than what they did last year. If I were them, I would still draft the QB, whether it's Drew Locke or Kyler Murray. I think that would be a good decision for the Broncos. But I think John Elway is terrified of drafting a quarterback, which is why he'll never do it. I think a lot of people don't give him the hate he needs for drafting, using a first-round pick to draft Paxton Lynch, who I think was one of the worst quarterbacks of all time drafted in the first round. I think he gets a lot of uh, a, a break, I guess you could say. I think he uh, fans don't put on him, you know, the last couple seasons. They don't put that on him as much as they should. He hasn't been able to draft a good QB. The, last, the two QBs he's drafted are Tim Tebow and Paxton Lynch. Tebow, everybody knows my opinions on Tim Tebow. He deserves another shot. But then he went out and he, he picked up Peyton Manning. He got Case Keenum. Uh, he he drafted Brock Osweiler. These things, it doesn't work out. He's not a good uh, draftee of quarterbacks, if draftee even is a word. And I think um, adding Joe Flacco just kind of solidifies that a little bit more. Now, again... If you want to add somebody like Drew Locke, I think Joe Flacco is a fantastic quarterback to learn under. But also, I don't believe Joe Flacco is somebody that's going to want to roll over and just hand the starting job off to a guy like Drew Locke or another rookie quarterback. Um, you know, we saw with the Ravens, he was kind of, you know, not really there with Lamar Jackson. And I understand that because him and Lamar Jackson have probably the most different play styles you can get anywhere with any other quarterback, uh, you know, stretch, any other backup to start a quarterback combo. Those were probably the two most different guys in the NFL. But, again, he really didn't give much to him. But you never know how this will work out for the Broncos. I just don't understand why they went out and they traded for 
Joe Flacco when they have Case Keenum on the roster. But I digress. We're going to move now to Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown has had quite possibly the worst span of like two to three months of anybody in the NFL right now. I just he yesterday or a couple days ago he released this this long video on Twitter talking about how it was great for the memories with the Steelers. Dude, you ain't been traded yet. You're still on the Steelers roster. You still have a contract with the Steelers. You have not been traded. So no thanks for the memories. If the Steelers want you there next year, they can have you there next year. And I think they'll trade him now. Obviously, he's kind of forcing their hand. But then you look at other things. He's dyed his beard and his hair blonde. Uh, he was caught. He has a report on him for domestic abuse. He was caught going 100 miles per hour in like a 35 mile per hour speed zone. The dude's his life is a little bit up in the air right now, and I get it. Some of those things, you know, aren't his fault. Maybe the domestic report was. You know, fake, that's what we're hearing right now. But he's just, things just aren't working out well for Antonio Brown. And if I'm a fan of a team thinking about trading for him, like you look at the Packers. I'm hearing a lot of people wanting to trade for Antonio Brown. Or even Odell Beckham, who has been thrown around there in trade talks lately. I'm not so sure I want the Packers trading for either of these two guys. The price would have to be right for me to give up, you know, something for them. Uh, I would obviously love to have either of those two guys on my team. But you look at the Packers with a young coach like Matt LaFleur. Matt LaFleur has never had um, any experience being the head coach of any sort of team. He doesn't really know how to deal with big personalities like Antonio Brown Odell yet. He doesn't know how to deal with those guys like yet, like that yet. And just forcing him, not really forcing him, I guess, but like kind of making him um, deal with both of these guys would not be an easy thing for a first-year head coach. You know, he's still trying to learn how to be a head coach, let alone adding one of the biggest headaches in the NFL to your locker room could make it a little bit difficult for him. So if I'm the Packers, I would kind of shy away from getting either of these two guys. But if the price is right, obviously you got to pull the trigger on them because they are once in a generational talent. And to pair them up with one of your number one wide receivers would be amazing. And then, obviously, I think Aaron Rodgers could help with that. But there's different situations like that. You know, there's a lot of young head coaches in the league who would love to have either of these two guys or even Le'Veon Bell. But it just doesn't – I just don't think, you know, young head coaches are prepared to deal with these type of guys. But you never know. We're going to move now to our last NFL storyline, and that is Demarius Thomas was cut yesterday by the Texans after tearing his Achilles. I've said it once. I've said it again. I'll say it a million times. No player is the same coming off an Achilles tear, and I think the Texans knew that, which is why they let him go. I don't really know. I don't really think they wanted to sign, you know, an older veteran with an Achilles tear. They do have Will Fuller coming back. He was kind of their number two last year, and they could go out there and try to pick up uh, another veteran wide receiver. But again, Demarius Thomas is going to be a pretty good name on the market right now. Uh, there isn't that many wide receiver talents available at free, in free agency, so he's a pretty good player to go out there and get. For them, but we're gonna move now to baseball. Got a couple base baseball signing storylines, and then we are going to get to the interview with Brian Anderson. But before that, I had to remind you guys about my guy Dom at D's Home Cuts. So we have A's Lawn Service and D's Home Cuts, two of the greatest companies known to man. D's Home Cuts has been providing professional haircuts to many guys around Northeast Ohio for the last couple of years. Me, Truman, and about 90% of our guests on the show have gotten their hair cut at D's Home Cuts at least once in their life. And let me tell you, we have never looked or felt better. For only $7, that's right, $7, you won't find a cheaper haircut anywhere on the planet. D's Home Cuts will provide you with a modern haircut and styling. He'll show you what to do. He'll tell if you, even if you go in there and you're, you're not sure what kind of haircut you want, Dom will give you the best haircut. He'll give you ideas. He'll make you look great. And for only $7, which goes all straight into his pocket, not into the pockets of some corporate haircut place. So go check him out on Instagram, at D's Home Cuts, professional haircuts at a low price. 
So two baseball storylines, and then we will uh, get to the interview with Brian Anderson. Aaron Nola, one of the best pitchers in the MLB, signed a four-year, $45 million extension with the Phillies. He's only 25 years old, coming off a Cy Young finalist in a year where he went 17-6 and with a 2.37 ERA. One of the most underrated pitchers in baseball, one of the best pitchers in baseball, is going to be with the Phillies for the next couple of years. Smart move by the Phillies, locking up their Cy Young for the next couple of years. Um, that's all I really have to say right now. Spring training is opening up, and Bryce Harper and Manny Machado still don't have a contract yet. I'm not so sure what's going on with that yet, so go ahead and um, keep an eye on that as we're trying to figure out, just the same as you, what's going on with that. Um, it really doesn't make much sense to me. But here it is now. We're going to move now to our interview with Brian Anderson. Again, one of the best interviews we've ever had on this show. Nolan Jones, last week, the Indians prospect, was our longest up to the point. We uh, I think he was about 20 minutes. But then Brian Anderson came in next the week after that, hit us with a half-hour-long interview. But it never felt like a half-hour. Just listening to him talk for uh, you know that half-hour it went by so quickly because we were just, you know, so amazed at all the stories and all the tips he has about broadcasting. It was just a really great interview. And we, we when we interview guys, we make up a huge list of questions. And we didn't even get halfway through all of our questions just because, you know, he has so many great answers and so many great stories for each question that we asked. And he is a true professional, and it was just an honor, an absolute honor, talking and speaking with him. Uh, so you know Brian Anderson. You might not know his name if you're not a Brewers fan, but you know his voice. You certainly do. He has had so many great calls over the years. He does, like I said, Brewers play-by-play -play, um, on the TV he does PGA events. He does national NBA events for TNT with Reggie Miller and all those guys. He even calls March Madness games. So you know who he is. Um, you know some of his calls. Roy Holiday's no-hitter in the playoffs. Um, Bronson Canning's buzzer beater versus Xavier in the uh, March Madness a couple years ago. So you know him. You know his calls. Um, so here he is, Brian Anderson. An absolute honor to talk to him. Uh, I'll see you guys right after the interview, but here he is, like I said, Brian Anderson. Enjoy. Um, professional sports announcer, Brian Anderson. Um, so let's just start right there. Is broadcasting something you always wanted to do? Not not always. I mean, I always thought I wanted to be involved in sports. Um, I wasn't sure what that was going to mean. You know, when I when I was growing up, I, I still had those those pipe dreams that I wanted to be a player. You know, I thought being a professional athlete was the greatest thing in the world. Kind of still do, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I was a college baseball player and scholarship player, and so I was pretty accomplished uh, in baseball. I played all sports growing up in Texas. I played high school football in Texas and um, played a lot of basketball. I never played for my school in, uh, in basketball, but I played a lot of basketball and then kind of focused my energies on on baseball but I love all the sports and play golf and so you know I always felt like I wanted to be athletic and be an athlete and then about my probably my junior year in high school as I was uh, playing games I just kind of found myself either in my in my mind or sometimes verbally but I, w I would call plays and I would like we all do you know you do the yeah. countdown and this is for the win, but I was doing it more, even when I, I was a catcher, so I would be behind the plate and I would be catching and I would be almost thinking about it as a broadcaster would. So I really started to get interested in those who were broadcasting professionally mm -hmm. and then didn't really think much about it. But when I got to my junior year in college, so then I realized I'm not good enough to play professionally um, at the next level in baseball. I need to start thinking about another career move and that's when I really got focused on um, on broadcasting journalism I changed my major from business to communications which was an English communications degree where I went to school which had some journalism and I got connected to uh, these guys with the San Antonio Spurs they had their training camp at my college so I, I was just doing everything and ended up uh, working in the business and I was a cameraman I did audio I did all kind of television tech mm -hmm. work just to get close to it and see what it was all about. 
Yeah. So uh, if you were to give, you know, tips to younger broadcasters, what would you say, you know, is something you wish you learned before you got into it that you know now? Well, I mean, I, I think it's important to be on the air or or do the gig. Like, do you know, for me, there weren't that many opportunities, so I had, I had to create opportunities. So I went um, to minor league baseball games, and I sat up in the stands, or I sat um, where I started in, in San Antonio. They actually allowed me into an auxiliary press box, and I brought my Radio Shack tape recorder, cassette tapes, this is back in the early 90s, and I just called games, you know. I just called plays and games. I'd listen to them and listen to my voice. And there's a, it's an excruciating period when you're doing that because when you hear yourself for the first time, um, yeah. your voice, your style doesn't really sound like what you would hear on television. The quality's not as good, the quality of the recording. So you kind of have to plow through that part of it because what you hear on television and then what you hear from yourself is going to be a completely different experience and horrifying, to be honest with you, um, especially when you hear yourself for the very first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys are a little bit different. Your generation, you've kind of grown up being being videoed, being you know the, the digital age of recording. You've grown up um, being on camera or hearing yourself, so it might not be that dramatic for guys like you or my daughters in your generation. So um, I think it is really important to kind of push through those early stages of imagining yourself calling an NBA playoff game or an MLB playoff game versus what the steps are to actually get to that point. There's a long process. And then, then it then it boils down to mechanics, right? Just get lost in the process and the mechanics before you start looking at the result of where you may be and what you may be able to be able to buy and the career and the life you may be able to live. Um, it's really important to just focus on, okay, t- today I'm going to be a little bit better than I was yesterday. And then what are those reasons? How am I going to get better today compared to yesterday? And I took that approach for a long time. I mean, I was just steady trying to improve. I can do this better. I can make this call better. I can punch this call differently so that that was a constant, and I still have a little bit of that in me even to this day, but I think it's important to always want to improve. Yeah. Do you think, you know, catching in uh, college really helped you, you know, with baseball? You know, because when you're a catcher, you know, you're behind the plate, you're kind of seeing everything? For sure. I mean, I, I love playing baseball, and I love the, the art of catching, and I still – think like a catcher when I watch a game, you know, you, you, you're the only player on the field that's facing out. Everybody's mm-hmm. looking at you. Um, so, yeah, I think so. I mean, with baseball, you know, it's, um, yeah, I think there's a little bit of leadership involved when you're a catcher. So you, you have to take control um, of the game a little bit. And I think that would translate to different things in my life, including my broadcasting, but, and maybe my personality is why I was drawn to the position in the first place and then it's it's kind of the underdog position too you know you get beat up back there and you you have to kind of do the dirty work and I've always enjoyed being the guy who does the dirty work you know and yeah um, I, I think that's a a character trait too that some people don't some people do I've always felt comfortable in that position and um, I think there's a lot that I've taken, not just from catching but in my baseball career, but just playing sports and my athletic career that I use every day, even to this day, not just in broadcasting, but in my everyday life and the competition, the, the you know, the, the pick yourself up part of it when you get knocked down. And mm-hmm. I coach a fifth grade boys basketball team right now, and I'm having these same conversations with them. You know, it's okay to to yeah. feel hurt and to be upset but you you know this is what competing's all about it's not always about winning the game it's how the process plays out to get to that point so there's great lessons in that definitely so uh you know growing up in the broadcasting ranks who are some of the broadcasters you know you look up you looked up to or even now that some that you look up to that are currently doing it well, there's a few of them that are the same guys, you know. I mean, I think Al Michaels would be uh, one of the guys that's still doing it, that when I was a kid he was doing it as well as anybody then, and he's still doing it as well as anybody. So he's mm-hmm. definitely a guy um, that I look up to. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of guys that I I either listen to or I, I think, you know, for young broadcasters, it's really important to do some element of parroting, meaning you, you're going to have to copy some things that you like or hear, and then you start to develop your style. I say that because you're going to have to come up with a template of how to do a game, the mechanics of it. And for me, that guy was Milo Hamilton because, you know, I lived in Texas. He was the voice of the Astros, Hall of Fame voice of the Astros. He's passed Mm -hmm. away since. But I listened to a lot of his games on the radio and um, never really got to know him well, but um, I I, I did do a Milo Hamilton uh, copycat basically when I started because I didn't know any different and then develop my own style. So I do think it's important to do that. Um, especially in the beginning, you don't want to sound like anybody else forever, but you do need that template. And his voice would be in my head when I would call a game, even on those mock games I was doing on the tape recorder, I was thinking, okay, what would Milo Hamilton say? And so, and then there's a, you know, obviously Vin Scully, Vin Scully was a guy that he was kind of like the elite, you know, you, there was Vin Scully and then there was everybody else. And I never even imagined okay, I'm going to get to the point where I can be as good as Vin Scully. I don't think any of us ever think that because it's it'll never happen. He's the best that ever did it. There'll never be anybody better. Um, and so he was kind of on a different pedestal. Um, but then there are guys like Ernie Harwell, who was very gracious to me, Hall of Fame baseball announcer, and a guy named Mark Holtz with the Rangers, and uh, Dave Barnett, who – did ESPN for years and was the voice of the Spurs when I was working there. Um, he really took me under his wing and mentored me. And so those are probably, you know, the bigger names that, that I followed and, and guys that I wanted to learn the business from and want to be like. Definitely. So now we're going to get into my beloved Brewers. Uh, so <laughs> obviously my, my family, we, you know, they watch you almost every game there when you're on the TV What's it like calling games for a city who is so passionate and loves the Brewers more than anything? Well, it's the greatest thing. I mean, it makes every game fun. I mean, even those, even when the Brewers weren't so good, and I've you know been through a few of those seasons as well. It's there's always that core of a fan base, and you know it matters to them and it matters to me, and um, you know that's the best part. And then last year to be able to experience that and go to the ballpark and there's just a different vibe and energy. And even during batting practice, you know, it's just the place is kind of lit all the time and it just feels, you know, something special is brewing. And, you know, those are the easy days in our business. Um, Those are the easy games to call. There's more pressure and you want to get them right. But those are the days when it just flows and there's narratives all over the place about where you're at and what the team's doing, what these players are doing. They're all positive narratives for the most part. So those are the easy days. The really difficult days are when your team is not playing well and there's not many people in the ballpark. Um, those are when you have to really be a pro um, and and bow your neck a little bit and, and, and call the games as you would if it was in a winning scenario. So to be in Milwaukee like last year um, was, I mean, that's a great experience for any broadcaster to be a part of that and be – somewhat connected to it you know the players are playing the game but you're offering a bit of the soundtrack for that and all those highlights that are being played and it's really Uh cool to be a part of i mean i feel very fortunate to have been in milwaukee as long as i have definitely so you know you've been in milwaukee a while uh and i'm in ohio obviously i listen to a lot of the games on the radio and that means i hear a lot of bob uecker can you talk a little bit about what he means to milwaukee yeah, I mean, he's an institution here. He's probably the most famous person uh, from Milwaukee. I mean, uh, maybe Les Paul and Bob Uecker. I mean, there's a definite um, there's a definite Mount Rushmore of famous people. I don't know a more famous person than Bob Uecker, um, and it transcends just sports. And he's from here. He grew up here, uh, always wanted to stay here, even when he was, you know, doing his bit with Johnny Carson and making movies and um, on his television show. And he always kept that connection to Milwaukee. So personally, he's always encouraged me to do the same, which I have. As I've done more national sporting events, I've always wanted to maintain 
a connection to Milwaukee. So um, he's not a mentor in that he does not go through mechanics of broadcasting. He doesn't he doesn't cons- really consider himself a journalist, a member of the media. Um, he's a Hall of Fame broadcaster, but he still thinks of himself as a player, mm-hmm. and he's just an amazing storyteller. So it's not you don't get that part of it like you do with most announcers. You don't get a little bit of the shop talk. He doesn't do that, but uh, he tells great stories, and we have great fun. We play golf every now and then, and um, he's just an institution here. You know, he's he's done things the right way. He's he's an incredibly talented person. I mean, he's as funny as any comedian. So people say, you know, he's a broadcaster who's funny. I would say he's actually a very gifted comedian who also does baseball broadcasting. Yeah. I mean, he's at the next level of of thinker, comedic mind that you could put him up there with the Jerry Seinfelds of the world, the you know, some of the best comedians you could think of. He's there and they all worship him. So when we go around, you these comedians all want to come get their time with Bob Euchre. And so that that's when you kind of know, wait, this guy's a different, you know, he's a, he's a different deal. They, they just had the California strong game to yeah. uh, benefit uh, some of the, some of the uh, victims in California with the fires and uh, the natural disasters. And Adam Sandler participated in the game and he was like a little kid next to Euchre. And so when Adam Sandler, who's been at the top of the profession still reveres Bob Euchre that way. That that pretty much sums up what he is to people outside Milwaukee, and then it's a completely different experience what he is and what he means to people in the city and Brewers fans uh, all over that listen to his games and get to enjoy him on the radio. Definitely. And then on TV, you're in the box almost every night with the Brewers legend and Bill Schroeder. Uh, what makes you guys such a great pair? Well, I think um, first and foremost, it's about relationships and working hard at a relationship. So um, I'm with Bill more than I'm with my wife during the baseball season. You know, the time spent together is extraordinary. And, you know, we don't always agree on things and we don't always have the same ideas. And we we both have our moments of crankiness and that that's just human nature. But I think it's really important in Rock's great at this and this is what his strength is and I would like to think it was my it is mine too but you have to work hard to serve the other you know recognize when the other is down when the other is up when the other is having a personal situation at home and I think that's kind of where you know you would never see that on television the end result on television is chemistry and you know he'll start or finish sentences that I start and vice versa um I kind of know what he's thinking. I kind of know where he wants to go, and we can just do this dance, you know, just do this dance on a broadcast. We know each other's tendencies so well because we've worked together so long. But you don't get to that point unless you um, work on all the other things away from the broadcast. Um, It's, you know, getting to know the families and understanding the trials and tribulations of the, the family Schroeder and vice versa with me. And we know each other's families well. We know... Uh, some of the bad times that we go through and the good times. And that's how you build that, which takes work. And you have to be willing to understand, like, there's a human being there. I work with him, yes, but I know him and I appreciate him and I'm interested in what what's going on in his life. And we don't just do that with each other. We do that with our entire crew. And it's really important to um, – to work hard at that. A lot of guys don't. A lot of broadcasters don't. And that's the, it, it, it will never last if it's not that way. I mean, you have this relationship with your brother, and you're gonna, you guys are going to be bonded forever. Mm-hmm. You're not always going to agree on stuff, and you're going to fight, and you're going to do all that. But your, your brother is your brother, and you, you, you don't get into that kind of connection, not that deep, but it's very similar. Definitely. Uh, so this past year, obviously, it was just a very special year for everybody uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, but being up close and watching Christian Yelich's MVP year, can you just talk a little bit about that and how special that was? Yeah, it was amazing. I've never seen anything like it. That last six weeks was one of the greatest runs of talent, of skill, success 
that any player has ever had in the game. I mean, you could put that window of time up against some of the greatest windows of any player's career. I mean, the legends of the game. He was he was that good. He was breaking records. He was, you know, offensively he was just on another level. And then then you throw in all the defense, the base running, the kind of teammate he is, the just what we were talking about. The guy works really hard at, at relationships and um Man, I mean, he's the full package. He loves the game. He he really doesn't. He takes care of his body. He's not one of these party guys that goes out. He he just he plays the game, and then he goes home. And then he shows up early and works at all the things necessary prior to the game, and then plays the game again. That's what he loves to do. Uh, he's a really good man, and he's a good player. And um, it's just an interesting time in Milwaukee. I mean, it it is possible that Milwaukee, Wisconsin could host and boast the two MVPs of the major sports. Oh, you know, the way Giannis Antetokounmpo is playing right now, he's he's trending towards MVP himself and in in a back-to-back seasons, a baseball season turning into an NBA season, you could have uh, two MVPs in their respective leagues. That would be an incredible accomplishment and a source of pride here for sports fans in Milwaukee. Definitely. Uh, so kind of a fun question here that I really was curious in knowing. Uh, who's the funniest brewer you've ever worked around? Well, Yuka for sure, but he's up there, you know, in a, play, yeah. in a place no one can ever get to. But uh, there's been, you know, Bill Schroeder's really funny, really funny guy, and that's uh, one of the reasons it works on on television too because he's got a quick mind and, you know, uh, really interesting guy that comes up with all these funny bits. Um as far as players go, I mean, I think um, I think one of the funniest guys, actually, as a coach, probably Ed Cedar, the third base coach. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he's really, really good. Uh, but there have been a lot of guys. Eric Kratz is hilarious. Just a really sharp mind, un, you know, situational awareness like nobody. Always understands everybody's situation and what they're in. And um, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed spending time with Eric Kratz and having some fun with him. I think Jesus Aguilar is up there, you know, and he and he brings the English, Spanish, the Spanglish piece to it, which can be hilarious. And uh, he does this bit where he acts like he doesn't understand you and tries to get the English speaker frustrated. And we all know what he's doing. He understands English perfectly, but <laughs> it's, it's yeah. really good. So, yeah, I mean, baseball players are by far uh, – funnier people in general than any other athletes that's and i've been around them all but just to, because you're together so much uh you almost have to it's as a survival instinct so those would probably be my guys right now i can't think of anybody who would be a would be funnier than those i gotcha uh last thing i just wanted to ask about the um uh box a little bit because i read in an article that you uh personally knew my, the head coach mike budenholzer from the time you worked with the spurs um, can you talk a little bit about what makes him such a great coach for Milwaukee? Yeah, we go way back. We were uh, together in San Antonio. And, um, he was actually the video guy and then became the assistant. So uh, when I was working, when I was in school and I'm working now as a cameraman, audio technician, kind of doing these uh, behind-the-scenes jobs, um, the Spurs was a place that hired me to do a lot of these TV jobs, and so he and I actually got to know each other well because in, in those days, um, the video guy, you know, had to get all the video from the source that we were providing, uh, and so we were in constant communication. It's not that way anymore, but mm-hmm. you know, the TV people, basically the TV department and or broadcasting department, and the assistant coaches and the video guys had to be connected because we shared a lot of uh, video feeds and whatnot with them. Uh, So that's kind of how I got to know him. And, you know, my boss in those days was the same guy who would be helping fix all the problems they may have. So, you know, I would be in the locker room uh, in the coach's office, you know, helping fix video feeds and monitors and whatnot. So we were just around each other a lot. And then he became an assistant coach and I ended up uh, as the sideline reporter. So, yeah, we we've known each other, and he's from that Greg Popovich tree, and uh, that's probably what makes him a great coach is that he has seen how it's done at its highest level and at its best level. He's seen 
He would have been there when Greg Popovich wasn't a, a popular figure in San Antonio, believe it or not, when they were calling for his job. Mm-hmm. Um, and most people don't even realize that was a thing, but that was a real thing. They started um, a whole campaign, Fire Pop campaign. Before hashtags were hashtags, there was a Fire <laughs> Pop yeah. campaign. So I think Bud saw that, saw the ability to stick to a plan and you know, always be pliable to maneuver with the league. And so the Spurs weren't a heavy three-point shooting back then, but they they needed those pressure releases. So they would bring in guys like uh, Del Curry and then eventually Michael Finley and then Bruce Bowen. So Mm -hmm. I think that kind of formulated the idea that, you know, space first creates. And now you hear a lot about pace and space. But back then, it was more space. We need space, room to operate. There needs to be space, uh, passing angles. I mean, the Spurs were one of the first teams that really utilized the baseline pass, the drive and baseline pass. And so you can remember all those championships, Tony Parker driving in the lane, nothing there, firing to the corner, to the wing, and there would be somebody there. So it was all about, okay, this is getting deep in the weeds here, but what makes him great is – people have to know there's going to be a player there, right? As opposed to this free-flowing offense where you recognize where the player is, then you make a pass. They were pretty revolutionary in that there was going to be a person in that position. You had to trust that there would be a person in that position. So then the ball moves really fast, bam, bam, bam. And so I think he's evolved over the years, and he took that concept to Atlanta, same kind of personnel, um, you know, you got to have your stars, but then you got to have a lot of glue guys who are in the right positions to make this all work. And so that's the formula, A, to find the players who are willing to do that, and B, to actually put that in play and, and execute it at a really high level. Um, and I think that's why he's a great coach, because he's been able to add pieces that have um, that have shown success in the NBA so he started playing faster with the Hawks. They won 60 games. He was the coach of the year. Um, so that was something that, you know, the Spurs were pretty low possession oriented back in those days. You know, yeah. they, they would use a lot of the clock. And so I think he's adapted well, and he's kept a lot of those principles. And, you know, he's really – you can't really rattle him, you know. Players can't rattle him. I think he saw how Pop treated every player 1-15 to 15 the same or somewhat the same. You know, you have to be able to yell at Tim Duncan yeah. <laughs> to get Brent Barry to do what you want. And I think Bud's taken that wherever he's gone. And I think that's a conversation that every coach who's worth anything would have with a star player. Uh, and and Budenholzer certainly would have that conversation with Giannis. Uh, yeah. look, I, you're going to have to be subject to my fury at some point if if you deserve it. And you have to be okay to handle that. And that's really what Pop did with Tim Duncan and David Robinson, and then, and Bud would have seen all that, and that's what he's been able to do with the Paul Millsaps of the world and Atlanta and George Schroeder, um, Dennis Schroeder, I mean, and then yeah. in Milwaukee here uh, with, with Giannis. Yeah, so uh, two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. What's your favorite uh, call in your entire history of broadcasting? Uh, I don't really have one. Um, I know there are, there are a few that I – I'm glad I was a part of, you know, the Roy Halladay no-hitter yeah, was, that was a major, you know, milestone for me in my career just to be able to mm-hmm. be there and call that game and then not mess it up. Um, <laughs> Bronson Koenig get a game-winning shot yeah. in the NCAA tournament. That's what I wanted. Um, <laughs> that was a special moment. You know, I've had a few buzzer beaters in the tournament, but none quite like that. Um yeah. That was to advance to the Sweet 16. We actually, I've had a number of NCAA tournament games that uh, have come down to the wire. Had a couple last year actually uh, mm-hmm. that were great, and uh, those are always fun. And then you know some Brewers moments. You know the the 2008 season, the Ryan Braun Grand Slam that ended up on an iPod commercial. Yeah. Um, a few days later, the Braun hit a home run to beat the Cubs uh, to put them ahead, and then. CC Sabathia closed the game. That helped him into the playoffs. And then there was some magical moments in 2011. Um, and then, of course, some great moments this year uh, mm-hmm. with the Brewers that are certainly up there and with the stakes 
so high and them coming back from five games back of the Cubs and being able to win that division uh, with a tiebreaker. I didn't get a chance to call the tiebreaker game, but, you know, we called the others, and those, yeah. are, those are special too. So they're yeah. like your children, you know. They're all up there. I'm just yeah. glad that I was I was able to do it, and somebody thought enough of me to put me in that chair because it's an honor to be able to see these things. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, last question. Who was your favorite athlete growing up as a kid? Uh, you know, Don Mattingly was a guy that uh, when I got into my teenage years, I really started to wanted to emulate. I wasn't a left-handed hitter, but I just loved his game, and yeah, he was quiet. You know, he just kind of let the bat do the talking, and I always kind of liked his look. And so Don Mattingly was one of those guys. Um, but honestly, I, I wasn't really star, and still I'm not to this day, but I wasn't ever really starstruck with players, even legends. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know why. I've never been an autograph seeker. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know why that is. I just the player to me was. I appreciate the performance, but I was always just about the scene. You know, the the yeah. arena, the stadium, the ballpark, the the game, the green grass, the colors of the uniforms. It was it was bigger than just an individual player uh, for me always and still is. So I, I love the scene more than I would do the hero worship of the player, but the closest guy to that would be Don Mattingly for sure, just because I I did really appreciate his game, the way he played, and if he did um if he did have a game on television in my area I would always watch just to watch his mannerisms. And that was in baseball and then in, in basketball of course, you know, Michael Jordan, I was already, you know, an adult in my twenties at that point, but you know, late teens and 20s, and, man, I mean, just watching that guy, it's like, wow, this is greatness right here. This is greatness yeah. that I get to experience. Definitely. Well, Mr. Anderson, I think that's all the questions we have yeah. for you. Uh, it was an absolute honor to talk to you, especially for being a Brewers fan, um, and I know my family's going to really love this, so we really appreciate <laughs> it. Good, man. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you boys, and uh, you guys take care of each other and be nice to your parents. <laughs> we and will. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Go Brewers. My, my pleasure. So there you have it. Interview with Brian Anderson. A really great interview. We really appreciate him giving us the time. That's now eight interviews we've had. Um, so we're only two away now from our goal. And I'm not s- saying this, but I think we already have those interviews scheduled. And we may have already had one done. So we may only be one away from our goals. But stay tuned to find out who they are. Um, within the next couple of weeks. But we want that's our show today. We want to thank you to our sponsors, Dee's Home Cuts and A's Lawn Service. We want to ask that you go into iTunes, give us five stars, rate, review us, and subscribe. Uh, find us also on to spot on Spotify. You can check us out on there, all our Android users. You can find us also on YouTube, uh, 12 ounceSports.com as well from 7 to 8 p.m. tomorrow. Tune into that as well as grandoldsports.com, a great website we've been working with the last couple of months. Um, so check us check us out on there, grandoldsports.com, or on their Twitter. You can also follow us on our Twitter, at TNT Sports Talk 12. That's where you can send us questions, comments, concerns. Our DMs are always open. If you want to be a guest on the show, send us a DM. Anything, anything at all, go to Twitter and check us out, TNT Sports Talk 12. Uh, but other than that, that's our show today. We want to thank you to our guest, Brian Anderson. Again, one more special thank you to him for spending some time with us. Uh, but other than that, have a great day. Tune in on Tuesday. We're going to wrap up some of the sports headlines from the weekend, as well as another interview with another great athlete. Check it out on Tuesday. Thanks, guys.